In today's video, we explore the Disco Era Star Rovers RPG from the legendary Archive Miniatures, as well as some other retro gaming artifacts. So hi folks, this is Lee from SkirmishWarGames.com. I'm here with Lynn. Hello everyone. And uh, wow, today is technically the latest installment of our Countdown to Stargrave series, but to be more accurate, it is actually a deep dive into some gaming nostalgia from the 1970s through the early 80s, which for me was kind of a golden age of sci-fi and fantasy gaming. So if you'll allow me to reminisce a bit about my days as a Wii gamer, we're going to talk about Star Rovers, the RPG, and some sci-fi figs from Archive Miniatures, as well as some additional disco era gaming nostalgia. So that'll be fun. That'll be fun. And I should also mention that we've posted an additional bonus video on the Skirmish War Games website. So if you go to the uh, bonus video tab and click on that, you can watch the uh, Red Block Army Box unboxing for AT43 that we now have posted. If you'd like to check that out, I will leave a link in the video description below. All right, let's talk about some Star Rovers. Okay, let's start by setting the Wayback Machine to the late 1970s, which was frankly an amazing time for fantasy and sci-fi enthusiasts. So uh, let's see. Advanced Dungeons and & Dragons and Star Wars were both released in 1977. And though I didn't know it at the time, a little UK company called Games Workshop had inked a deal to distribute D&D uh, &D in Europe and uh, would subsequently open its first retail store in London in the spring of 1978. So believe it or not, all of the uh, entities I just mentioned, Star Wars, D&D, &D, Games Workshop, are woven into the story of Archive Miniatures. So uh, Archive was a California-based uh, miniatures company, and they were, among other things, one of the earliest producers of metal RPG figures. So uh, let me show you some of the fantasy figs I bought back in the day. So these are some actual uh, Archive figs that I bought in the late 1970s that were used for actual D&D games back in those days. Here's a ranger and a paladin. This is a hobgoblin on a wild boar. And if you look at the base, it says, copyright 1978, number 630, archive miniatures. And uh, somebody actually went in there with an engraving tool and etched this text into the base of this lead mini. So I don't know if they had to do that for everything. This Paladin mini was pretty cool because there weren't that many D&D uh, &D figs in uh, full plate mail. So he was kind of handy to have. Here's a bunch of goblins that I used from my... Uh, Swords and Spells army, and um, actually goblins, outside of the Wolf Riders, are not the ideal troops. They are not that strong, they are not that fast, and they have very poor morale. I actually had quite a few more of these archive figures, both the fantasy figures I'm showing you here, and the sci-fi miniatures I will show you later. But uh, when I graduated from college and moved out of state, I didn't want to haul everything with me. So unfortunately, a lot of those miniatures got uh, relegated to the dumpster, which seems like a travesty now, but I guess at the time was expedient. Fortunately, I did have the presence of mind to save at least a few, so uh, that's better than nothing, I guess. Yeah, I bought this guy in the late 70s and uh, haven't painted him yet, obviously. <laughs> Maybe someday. So as you can see, the details on the archive miniatures might be a little rough by today's standards, and these are made out of lead, and they were actually a little bit bigger than 25 millimeter. Here is a Cadian. He's going to time travel back to the 70s so you can see kind of how he compares this is an amazon with a bow here is the uh, centaur here's a goblin with an axe so not terribly out of scale this might be closer to 25 millimeters here but as you can see this paladin is actually quite a bit taller than the cadian so uh, he would probably tower over a regular 25 millimeter figure and the neat thing about archive which we'll show you here in a minute is they uh, seem to have taken some of the illustrations from the first version of the Monster Manual and then made miniatures based on those. And so if you're playing D&D &D and there were some monsters in the Monster Manual you wanted to use in your game, there might be uh, more or less the exact figure for that, which was pretty handy. So these are the fantasy figs, and uh, that's going to lead into the discussion about the uh, sci-fi Star Rovers figs, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Okay, so where's the GW connection? Well, from what I've read... Games Workshop was actually a distributor for Archive, so it's very possible that UK gamers could have purchased Archive minis at GW's original store in Hammersmith, London. So uh, perhaps they were buying the same goblins as I was, 
I myself, however, purchased Archive Minis a world away in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. So I bought uh, mine at uh, Big Sky Books, which was a new age alternative bookstore located in uh, Fairbanks' infamous Second Avenue. And uh, let me tell you, Two Street in Fairbanks was a very interesting place during the pipeline days. So Big Sky Books is also where I bought these two issues of The Dragon magazine, uh, which for a small town kid in the pre-internet era were like precious hobby gold. So this is where I got my hobby fix. So The Dragon was TSR's tabletop gaming magazine, and it premiered in 1976, replacing a previous publication called The Strategic Review. Interestingly, Games Workshop launched its own magazine, White Dwarf, a year later in 1977. So... There you go. So these magazines are falling apart, but I want to open them up and show you a couple of things which is going to relate to our conversation today. So we'll start with September 1978. Ralph Partha. So uh, this is the ad for Star Rovers, and this is in September of 1978. And it's funny because there is no contact info on here at all. Um, just Star Rovers is available in the Archive Miniatures booth. Now, I don't know if that's in Origins or at Gen Con or wherever. But this must have been just sort of an awareness ad talking about the game. So I'm going to read you just a little bit of text here from the bottom. So it says, Star Rovers is the saga of your adventures through the cosmic wastes. Rove the stars in the Zychromium Zephyr. Experience the raptures of the void. Survive the hazards of hyperspace with your mind and molecules intact. Repel the boarding actions of the buccaneers of space. Outrun the swift patrol ships of the Empire. Explore exotic planets for alien artifacts and trading goods. Encounter bizarre alien life in distant galaxies. Trade your contraband cargo to the underworld at Moondog Mods Cantina. Outwit the imperial bureaucracies and galactic corporations of Abraxas and much, much more with uh, two hand-drawn exclamation points at the end. So I love the typesetting on this ad. <laughs> There's some weird spacing and sometimes the lines are smushed together. So uh, that is the Star Rovers ad from Archive Miniatures from 1978. Okay, so here's a spread of miniatures from various manufacturers. So here's Archive Miniatures here. Here's a creature from the AD&D Monster Manual. So that is the Land Shark or the Bulette or the Bullet or whatever they call it. And uh, some space figures, some other figures. But over here, number five, McEwen Miniatures. You see, these guys are definitely Star Wars. So there's Vader and a bunch of Stormtroopers. So this may be a little bit of a mystery here because I looked online and I can't find any reference to McEwen making Star Wars figures back in the 1970s. And with Star Wars being so collectible, normally somebody somewhere would have referenced these figs had they existed. So if you know one way or the other whether McEwen was making Star Wars figures, please leave a comment in the comment section because uh, we'd love to hear about it. But uh, I do know that Archive Miniatures got into a little bit of trouble with Lucasfilm over making unsanctioned Star Wars figures or uh, figures that looked very similar to uh, Star Wars characters. And it sounds like Archive was getting creative trying to find ways around the licensing issues because they were making uh, Stormtrooper minis that had bunny ears on them or um, I've seen a Chewbacca with a tail or uh, Darth Vader as a duck, stuff like that. And so those uh, kind of unsanctioned Star Wars uh, Archive miniatures are kind of collectible if you run across any. And here's one last thing. So Stan Johansson miniatures, number one. That's this guy here. Stan Johansson is still around. I think we bought some little Hot Wheels scale cultists from him along with some turrets and other things. And so you might check him out. I had no idea he'd been around for that long. So that is uh, the Dragon Magazine from uh, September 1978. And um, just for fun, let me show you one other thing. This is from the October issue. There's another Star Rovers ad, and here they do have the address, so I guess you could have mailed them a letter if you wanted more information. So here's what I wanted to show you. This is a spread of old uh, metal Starship miniatures from the late 70s. So lately we've been thinking about A Billion Suns. That's that new Starship game from Osprey and sources for Starship miniatures. So if you are a uh, classically minded uh, gamer, you might look all the way back to the 70s or early 80s at some of these lead minis from uh, some of the older casters. So this collection here, Collection D, is from Grenadier Miniatures, and we actually have this set in the original cardboard box. So if we ever get into a billion suns, we might have to break these guys out, paint them up, and uh, deploy them. Let them finally go on a mission. That's right, after all these years. 
Okay, so that is some old uh, Dragon magazines from 1978. So as you saw in the ads from uh, the Dragon magazine, in 1978, Archive Miniatures was promoting Star Rovers, a sci-fi-themed RPG, which apparently involved game designer David Hargrave, who was, and here's another uh, sidetrack we're going on to, the author of the Ardune fantasy and sci-fi RPG. Now, Ardune wasn't D&D, but it was more or less compatible with it. So if you wanted to turn the intensity up to 11, Ardune offered uh, even more dangerous monsters, overpowered magic items, deadlier traps, and the legendary critical hit chart. So there is the critical hit and fumble chart. The highlights are someone else's, not mine. But uh, my favorite was, if you rolled a 95, your guts were ripped out and had a 20% chance of tangling your feet. So yeah, as uh, preteen boys, we felt that that was hysterical. And then I read an article, I think it was in Time Magazine at the time, or some other national news publication. And they actually referenced that exact line in the critical hit chart to uh, sort of make the point that D&D was a danger to America's youth. And I remember reading that thinking, dumbass, that's not even D&D, that's uh, some other guy's book. But uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care. They don't care. They're trying to make a point about RPGs in general. So this is an original copy from 1977, but you can actually buy reprints of the Ardune books from a company called Emperor's Choice Games and Miniatures. So if you're into gonzo vintage RPGs, it's definitely worth a look. It's pretty hilarious. Anyway, apparently David was phased out of the Star Rovers project, but by the time 1981 came around, Archive did manage to produce Module 1 with the rules and a bunch of other stuff, and there was supposed to be other modules that followed but this is as far as they got. So this is the entirety of uh, Star Rovers right here. So they had this box set and a bunch of miniatures, which we're going to look at a little bit later. So in 1981, I was aware this existed. I had seen the ads in the Dragon magazine, and I actually had quite a few of the archive sci-fi miniatures because we were playing Metamorphosis Alpha and Gamma World and a lot of kind of uh, sci-fi RPG games. And so they were handy for that. And unfortunately, a lot of those minis ended up in the dumpster along with everything else. But in the years since, I've kind of collected a few sets just out of nostalgia. And in 2018, just for the heck of it, I was looking on Amazon and I looked up Star Rovers and a third party bookseller was selling this box set in the original shrink wrap for 80 bucks. Now that seems like a lot, but I, I bought it anyway, just cause the cool factor is like, there it is, there's a copy of Star Rovers and how often is that gonna come up? So I bought it, and now we're going to commit sacrilege. We're actually going to, Lynn is twiddling her fingers, we're actually going to break open the seal on this and look at the stuff inside. Now, this is an RPG. It's not really a traditional uh, war game, but there's going to be a lot of cool vintage uh, sci-fi stuff in here. So we're going to take a look at it just for uh, historical purposes, I guess, just to kind of uh, document it. Plus, I want to see it. And smell that old paper smell. Yeah, right, smell the old paper stock. And then once we do that, we'll show you some uh, vintage uh, Star Rover minis from uh, the late 70s, early 80s. All right, let's uh, go ahead and break the seal. So module one contains over 130 pages of fully illustrated, easily referred to rules, starship floor plans, quick reference sheets, five dice, a map board of the Moondog Mods Cantina, Let's see, encounter charts, a timeline chart, and everything you need to create whole star systems and explore them. Journey with Star Rovers into the future and learn the incredible secrets that await you. Archive, miniatures, and game systems. This was the one and only game they produced, I believe. All right, let's see what's in here. Whoa! It's very colorful. It is, look at that. Even colored dice. Vintage dice. Go ahead and open up our dice for us. So this is the first time I've seen something like this. So it's a bound book. It's kind of bound in this uh, plastic binder. Crazy psychedelic artwork. Let's take a moment to bask in the glory that is Star Rovers. We'll just do a quick flip through and look at some of the illustrations. I like the artwork. Yeah, this kind of takes me back. Now, I didn't actually have this game, but the style 
even the font choices here kind of remind me of the, uh, you know, the digital watch era or the uh, Triumph TR7 when Triumph was selling cars in the U.S. I'm going to look forward to reading this because it really seems like it has a lot of uh, vintage RPG cool. And this looks a lot like the illustrator who did some work for the Arden uh, Grimoire, actually. That looks pretty similar, which would make sense if Hargrave was involved. I heard that he was involved at first and then kind of phased out and then some other people sort of finished it up. This is crazy. So that uh, snail there with two heads, I had that miniature, that dragon snail. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. And now he's pretty cool in a landfill, which is sort of sad. Maybe someone rescued him. I had that robot miniature, but I didn't know how to put it together. Apparently, if I'd have seen this picture, that would have helped. Because it doesn't really have a head. And so you get the arms and the legs and everything like that. It's like, how the heck? Are we missing a piece? Apparently not. I had one of those that's kind of a feline trooper. So one of the things in uh, Star Rovers is there's kind of like feline troops, lizard troops. There's some troops called the Frinks, which are kind of like ducks almost. <laughs> and uh, aphids and others too. So Space Centaur, we have one of those. We're going to show you that here in a minute. So this Warbot here actually had a couple of these minis. And unfortunately, the end of the ray gun there kept breaking off of them. But these were very cool Flash Gordon type uh, robots. I wish I had a couple still. So when I read the blurb from the ad a few minutes ago and uh, listed off all the adventures they say people would have in Star Rovers, that doesn't sound too dissimilar from uh, what people might see in Stargrave. I love this. If you have questions, divide your question sheet into two columns, write your questions on the left, and leave the right hand column blank for a short reply. All questions must include a self-addressed stamp envelope. Please allow three weeks for a reply. Overseas, six weeks. <laughs> so, anywho. I want to see the board. All right, we'll take a look at that. So that is Star Rovers from Archive Miniatures. And uh, I'm glad I bought it, and I'm going to read it. A little postcard for comments. Sword Lords of the Eastern Regions from uh, Archive Game Systems. Now, from what I've read... Star Rovers was the one and only game they ended up producing, so maybe this was something they had in mind but never quite made it to market. Interesting. The line chart. Yes. This is, okay. So here we have the timeline chart of the known universe, the uh, Interstellar Age, the Star King's Age, Expansion Age, the Galactic Age, Imperium, Psionic Age, Post-Expansion Age, Fragmentation Age, the Astral Age. Okay, let's see what they say here. So, for example, in the uh, Emergent Age, they find a cure for the common cold, and they also know astral architecture. So the Nuclear Age, space research, media computing, and terrorism, suburbs, condominiums, geodesic domes, ghettos, and subterraneans. Interstellar Age, ring worlds, underground metropolises, Star Knights, the metaphysics of E.G. Star Knights. Early psionic revivals. <laughs> so that is the uh, extensive timeline chart for the Star Rovers universe. This is some heavier cardstock paper. So this is, what is this? This is Moondog Mod's Cantina, located on Beta Centauri. Mm -hmm. There's even a snack dispenser. Snack dispenser, spice racks, salt, pepper, and sulfur. Waiting area for droids and robots. Bouncer station, slot machine, beds for rent. Male humanoid, female humanoid, non-humanoid. Video phone booth, out of order. Waste disposal, 3D games, galactic roulette, and the kitchen, the conference room, the jukebox, and 3D TV. Droids and robots not welcome. Droids and robots not welcome. Non-Humanoid Waste Disposal Unit, number 95023. What is this? Okay, so this is... The Zirconium Zephyr. Ah, this must be the adventurer ship, the Zirconium Zephyr. Air conditioner, computer, cockpit, forward screen, sensor, bathroom, freshwater tank, laundry, turret motors, storeroom, living quarters... An all-terrain vehicle hangar. So that is the Zirconium Zephyr. And these are the general plans. 
So I like how the game designers add these uh, few extra touches to kind of flesh out their universe. So while the Zephyr is an imaginary spaceship, we actually have the plans right here, which uh, kind of makes it more concrete. Here is the Universal Resolution Matrix. Looks pretty serious there. And a lot of uh, small text. <laughs> but it's nice they provide you with a cheat sheet. That would be a lot to keep in your head. Yeah, especially the way my head is functioning these days. Now, what's disappointing a little bit is that I had seen another set for Star Rovers being sold on eBay, and it looks like they had an archive miniatures catalog in there, which would have listed the uh, various um, Star Rovers minis, of which there are many. They had quite a few different races, and uh, we don't seem to have that. So. so I would have read some of that off, but if you're interested, you'll have to look online, and there's a couple of websites that kind of uh, record uh, old miniatures from the past. And you can see the extensive line of archive stuff. Okay, at the time I was buying them, archive miniatures came in these little uh, plastic packs. And I think later on they had kind of a hard stock uh, cardboard backing and the minis were kind of shrink wrapped to the front. But uh, at this time they were simply loose and so occasionally they would rattle against each other and things would break. Like this uh, space centaur here, that little ray gun he has, the tip of that was uh, legendary for breaking off. But this guy is intact, and this is a very cool sci-fi mini. And he's got quite a bit of detail on him, so I would say that uh, they did a great job with this dude. And I haven't seen anything similar to this anywhere else. Maybe someone else makes a space centaur, but to my knowledge, this is the finest space centaur available. Is he going to get painted? Well, that's a good question, and you know, like a lot of questions in this crazy old world, it's sort of hard to say. This guy is a mud hopper. Yes, given infinite time and resources, he will get painted. Somebody else painted this guy. This is a Plastron Android, and I did have a couple of these guys back in the day, but uh, they didn't make the cut, so I had to go on eBay and find one, and I think he actually came from, from maybe uh, the UK, so he traveled a long way to get here. This uh, robot, who you can see on the cover, so you can see that little robot here on the cover, and he is definitely not R2-D2, he is RT-22. So a completely different robot from a completely different uh, universe, and he's some kind of a uh, service droid. He's got pinchy claws. He does have pinchy claws. Better to snip you. These came from someone else's collection, but I have them here somewhere. I know that because I pulled them out specifically a few years ago saying, I want to save these guys. I want to make sure I still have them. And I put them in a safe place along with my uh, Bounty Hunters collection from uh, Star Wars Miniatures Battles. They're all in the same safe place. And I don't know where that is. It's very safe then. <laughs> it's very safe. So here is uh, RT-22 and these two little gun bots here. They're great. They are basically just... Uh, guns on wheels with eyes. What I'm thinking is uh, when we get into Stargrave and we need some recruits, which basically just have light armor and uh, a gun, these guys could be recruits. So if you can't afford to equip a full crew, you just throw out a couple of tin cans with a Luger on the top and some uh, erector set wheels and send them out into the world when you're trying to gain your loot. So expendable little gun bots. I like their little wheels. Yeah, they're pretty neat. So I'm glad we have a couple of those. We talked about how some of the races in the game were based on different animals, and I showed you the picture of the feline uh, race. This is a lizard race, and I forget exactly what they call them, but this is a soldier with a rifle, and we have a couple of those guys. So that's uh, space lizards. This is one of the duck characters, and I think this guy is called an armored frinks. I may be getting that wrong, but I think that's what he is. So he is a space duck in a power suit. And there was a bunch of duck characters. They had a duck Darth Vader. They had <laughs> all kinds of them. And uh, so this is the one and only one that I have of this species. But he's pretty neat. He would make a funny recruit for Stargrave. He would make a funny soldier in power armor, which I think is one of the options. So why make him a recruit? He could be a, yeah. a heavy a specialist. So this is where things might get a little bit weird. So I don't know if many of you younger folks remember Patty Hearst, 
but she was a newspaper heiress who got captured by the Simonese Liberation Army, and then um, it's vague as to whether she joined them voluntarily or was brainwashed, but she ended up getting arrested for bank robbery. So this character here is called Bianca Snow, and so she's their version of Snow White, but she's very similar to Patty Hearst in appearance with her beret and her gun there. So you could look up some old pictures of Patty Hearst and, uh, you know, determine for yourself if you think that's the case. But this is Bianca Snow, and so she is essentially Snow White. And, of course, if you have Snow White, you have to have the Seven Dwarves. And so there's a bunch of these space dwarves here, which are kind of like, I guess, proto-squats. So before squats were even an idea in the mind of uh, Games Workshop, you had uh, these space dwarves from Archive Miniatures. This guy is going to fall over because he's got the typical big lumpy piece of metal on the bottom of him that needs to be shaved off. But this is probably my favorite of the uh, space dwarves. And he's kind of this robot looking guy. Now, if you count up, that's not seven dwarves. But I think in the seven dwarf pack, I saw a picture that said one of these little gun bots was number seven. So you got Bianca Snow, six dwarves, and a gun bot. And that was uh, Bianca Snow and the seven dwarves. Dopey the robot. I hope he's not that dopey if he's rocking a gun head. So for better or worse, that is my collection of uh, archived Star Rovers miniatures. I had more. I didn't keep them. But uh, this is what I have now. And I think there are probably just enough of these 70s era figures in here to create a decent Stargrave crew if we were so inclined. And that would be pretty cool. You have Bianca. You have the armored space duck and a couple of riflemen. You have a couple of robots, including RT-22, and a bunch of space dwarves. So yeah, some of those space dwarves could be uh, safe crackers and hackers, and some could be uh, regular soldiers. And I don't think the mud hoppers would serve much of a purpose, but uh, they could be aliens that pop up from the wandering monster chart. And then, of course, there is the space centaur, and I think he would have to be the captain just because he's too cool. Now, Lynn's question was, are these guys going to get painted? Well, it depends which uh, Stargrave crew gets rotated to the top of the roster. So we have several options now. I just got in the mail the other day a, uh, a undead spaceman crew. We have some old pit fighters from Necromunda. We have a bunch of old Chaos uh, space marines. So yeah, we have lots and lots of options. It just depends uh, which team actually gets painted before uh, the end of April. So we'll have to see. It'll be a surprise. I don't even know what it's going to be at this point. But like I said, these old miniatures have a lot of nostalgia for me because uh, at least some of them were actually used uh, back in the 70s and the 80s when I first started playing these games. And so, yeah, that was good times and fond memories. And so I'm glad I kept at least some of these guys. And obviously, I felt strongly enough about it to reacquire some at uh, slightly higher prices than you would have paid. Back in the day? Back in the day. Well, Lynn, what do you think about our little trip down memory lane here? It was a lot of fun. Those are some pretty cool minis. The minis are cool, and I love the design, and of course it's just kind of fun to look back at uh, the history of RPGs and see what people are coming up with. And uh, this looks like someone really made an effort, or some team, to uh, put some details in this, you know, with the uh, sketches of the cantina and the, uh, you know, layout of the spaceship and the timeline. Just somebody wrote that whole thing out, you know, scribbled that down on some legal pad and put it on that thing to print up. And, you know, it just adds a lot of uh, depth to what they were trying to do here. So kudos to them. I'm sorry it didn't work out, but it still exists and we got to share it with people. So hopefully uh, folks on the Internet will enjoy it as much as we do. And the colors are very 1970s. Yeah, the graphics are very 1970s, and I'm glad they didn't hold back. They just went for it, so might as well. Okay, folks, well, that is our look at the uh, Star Rovers RPG and miniatures from 1978 through 1981. We hope you got a kick out of it. And yeah, is this now the end of our Countdown to Stargrave series? I would have normally said yes, but something showed up in the mail just the other day. Void? Not Void. I do have some Void stuff, but I don't have a box set for Void. But it is a, uh, it's close. I will say the name is close. We had a fellow uh, named RC who popped on and left a comment saying, have you seen this game? And I'd never heard of it. I looked it up and I found a copy for 40 bucks on Amazon. And so I ordered that. So that is our mystery game. 
And if all goes well, we'll unbox that here in a few days. But until that time, as always, folks, thank you very much for stopping by. If you like the things we do here, please subscribe to our channel. Please give this video a big thumbs up. And of course, please visit us online at the website, skirmishwargames.com. And uh, Lynn, why do you have that look on your face? Because I want to know what the new game is. <laughs> I'll show you off camera. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but yeah, I think we have one more in the series we might uh, go ahead and post here before we go on to some other stuff. Sounds good to me. Okay.